Oh, hello. So, we're going to start by opening up a new sketch, and we're going to just lay the foundations for this project together as a class. And we're going to be learning something called parameters. This is the big new thing. This is a big new thing which will allow us to sort of organize our grid structure. And it's technically not the only way to do it, but I thought I would take this opportunity to introduce us to uh, parameters because they're pretty useful. We've seen parameters in different contexts, but this will be a, sort of an object-oriented programming. It's a, a new context. So first of all, I'm going to call this project Brick Breaker. So I'm going to save it. It's going to be called Brick Breaker. You could do a whole study on the names of the Brick Breaker clones. I'm not sure what was the original Brick Breaker game. It might have been Breakout. I'm not too sure, but uh, we'll just have to wait. Oh, I'm so sad. Uh, sa saving a project is very slow on the surface. Maybe, maybe because this is on YouTube now, S Bill Gates or somebody will see this video and be like, wow, we have to make the surface better. There we go, alas. So, we, we're going to do this in an object-oriented fashion. And the way we make objects, of course, is with classes. And the way we organize our code is we have one tab per uh, class. So we're going to make a bunch of tabs right off the beginning. So I'm going to make a tab for the ball called ball. I'm going to make a tab for the bricks. And it's going to be just a single brick that we're going to write a class for. So I'll call that tab brick. And I'm going to make a tab for the paddle as well. So just so you know, I'm going to be making you guys responsible for making the ball and paddle classes because they're very similar to what we did in the Pong project. But you're going to have to figure out how to turn those into classes as opposed to... Uh, just kind of coding them in some sort of function that's called by draw. So that'll be an interesting experience to sort of translate something you've done uh, in a non-object-oriented manner and make it into an object. You might wonder, is it really necessary? Well, there's only one paddle and one ball, so why make them objects? And you would be right. However, it's possible that you would want to add more balls into this. Maybe you have 10 balls that are flying around and stuff. So we'll make them objects, and I think it'll be a useful exercise, even if we don't end up having more than one thing. Uh, and of course, in our first tab, that's going to be where our setup and draw is. So let's put that stuff down, that basic stuff, and then we'll go and make the brick class together. We'll see what's new about object-oriented programming in this project. So first of all, in the main tab, let's get our void setup going on and our void draw going on. And I'm going to make my project 600 by 600, which is apparently my favorite project size, but feel free to not make it 600 by 600, everybody. This is not required. It is just the number I am choosing. From experience, I have noticed that people who make their projects full screen have a bit of a disadvantage when they go to debug stuff because they can't see the console at the same time as their project. So unless you have a good reason for making it full screen, I recommend not making it full screen just to make development a little easier. So that's where we'll just stop in the main tab. We'll come back to the main tab in a minute. Let's go make bricks. So I'm going to go to the brick tab, and we're going to make class brick. And remember, a class is a blueprint, which will specify what every brick needs to know, what information needs to remember. It'll specify what the values of that information will be. Oh, I just, I just wanted to make sure I'm actually recording. I forgot to double check. Uh, and also, it's going to define what the behaviors of this thing is. So we're not going to do the behaviors today. That's going to be something we'll, that will come down. I guess we will. We'll do the show function. But we won't worry about the act function just yet. So what we're going to do, first of all, is specify the information it needs to remember. And we're going to start really simple. We're going to start with float x and y as our instance variables. Maybe we're still new enough to this stuff that it's, it's useful to write these terms down again. So I'm going to just put a header for instance variables here. Later on, if we want our, our bricks to have unique colors, or if we want them to have a certain number of lives or hit points, or if we want them to contain a power-up or something like that, 
then we'll add more information to the instance variables. But we're just doing the basic setup of this project. So let's just leave it like that. And that will give you some space to be creative for your own projects. Next thing is the constructor, which is sure a fancy way of saying this is the function with special name naming conventions that tells us the uh, starting values for the instance variables. And this is where we're going to run into a problem. So I'm going to put our constructor down. Its name is going to be the same as the class. No void or anything. And then x equals something and y equals something is we're going to put there. We want to make this a grid. And so the question becomes, well, what do you write there? Like, how do you build that into a blueprint? How does a brick know where to place itself in the structure? Yeah, I heard a possible answer there. Basically, it's, it's a question we're going to leave open for a few minutes. So we're going to come back to this. I know it doesn't run if we have the question marks here. So I'm going to just leave it like that and, and move on. So don't be too scared if you have some red lines there. This is sort of our question. How do we get the constructor to put the brick in the right place? There's a lot of commotion going on. Uh, we'll, we'll just leave it at that. I think it's okay. What's happening? Is that a video? I don't know. It's all good. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, so <laughs> it's Valentine's Day. It makes sense. Uh, so anyways, we're going to make a show function. And even though we don't know where this brick needs to go yet, we certainly can show the brick. So let's show the brick. And I would like you guys to make your bricks ellipses because the math involved of bouncing off of uh, two circles, bouncing off of each other and checking for collisions is significantly more simple when you make them ellipses. So I've, I've taught it with, with rectangles for two years in a row. And every year I'm like, ah, oh, we really should have done it with ellipses. So this year I'm finally going to do it with ellipses. If you are allergic to ellipses, you just do not like the thought of your game involving ellipses, then you, you don't have to do this, but I recommend if you don't have a good reason to, to do differently, then just go with what we're doing, and you'll see the math involving collisions with ellipses is really straightforward and, and, and easy to do. So I'm going to just fill it with some color. I'll just do white for now, and we'll draw our ellipse at X and Y, wherever that's going to be, and we'll give it a diameter of like 50, 50, or whatever number you want to use. It doesn't really matter what its size is. Okay, so we have a, a half-written constructor. We have a show function. Let's leave it at that, and let's go and make the infrastructure for creating this stuff. So we want to go ahead and, and create some kind of uh, structure for making these ellipses. So I'm going to go over to my main tab. So what we need to do is, of course, make the data structure, the array that is going to hold many bricks, right? So to do that, we're going to do what you guys have been doing for the last several classes, and that is to make an array and the loops to automate the arrays. And as, as great as that video is next door, can somebody grab the door and just, just close it for us? Thanks. All right. It's very royal sounding though over there, isn't it? So we're going to make ourselves a brick array. So it's going to look like this. Brick array. And we got to name it something. What's a good name for a brick array? Bricks. Thanks for not being too creative with your naming of, of your array. I see people get all sorts of crazy and call it uh, Wellington the Third and things. I'm like, but it's an array of bricks. Please name it with logical names. How many bricks do we want? Well, this is up to you. I don't really care how many bricks you have. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make six rows of 10. So that's 60 bricks. So I'm going to make a n variable. Let's just keep track of the number of bricks. I'm going to make it 60. And you guys can make whatever number you want to make. It's up to you. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and do the loops. So if you been kind of following along with the course so far, you know that the loops basically count from zero to n. And each time they make, uh, they make use of that number as an index to the array. And then in the setup, we call the constructor for that index. 
And in the draw function, we call the behavior functions of that index. That's sort of the difference between what we're doing in those two loops. Uh, the other thing is we also have to make the array, because right now it's a null pointer. So let's do that first, and then we'll make our two while loops. So the bricks array, we have to instantiate. That fancy word means just create the array with n number of things in it. So we say bricks equals new brick array with n elements or n bricks inside of it. And let's put a comment down just to make sure everybody sees what that is. Makes a brick array with n bricks. And of course, you can change n to be uh, whatever number you want. And again, this is exactly what we've been doing all through January and February. So if this is new to you, please feel free to ask questions about it, and we will make sure that things are going smoothly for you. Next, we have to make our loops to automate the creation of all 60 of those bricks, because nobody wants to say brick sub 0 equals new brick, brick sub 1 equals new brick, brick sub See, I'm already bored myself. I feel the, the terrible boredom, and I've only gotten to 2. So we're going to automate that process with a while loop. So we'll use a variable like i, for example, to be our index. It's going to start at 0 because indexes start at 0. And we're going to keep going as long as or while i is less than n. And every time we're going to do something, and then we're going to increase i. i equals i plus 1. And then what do we do each time? Well, each time we use i as our index, and we construct a brick at that index. So we call the constructor. So it's bricks sub i equals new brick. Now we still haven't solved the problem of where that brick should go. So that's a known problem that we'll get back to very soon. But that's our basic structure. And you know what? This exact same structure is what we're going to do to automate the showing of the bricks as well, right? But the showing of the bricks happens in the draw function. This is us making our bricks. So this makes a new brick. We only want to do that in the setup to set everything up, and then once they're all made, we want them to show themselves, and then eventually, we don't, we're not going to do that today, but eventually we'll have the bricks check to see if they've been broken by the ball. So that part goes in the draw function. So this is where our behavior functions will happen. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. It's going to be exactly the same. It's going to be int i equals 0, because indexes start counting from 0 in arrays. And we're going to say, well, i is less than n, because we don't want to go beyond the bounds of the array, or we'll get the index out of bounds error. Uh, we're going to go i equals i plus 1 at the end, because we want to go to the next brick to tell the next one to show. And then how do we actually get it to show? Well, that's bricks sub i dot show. And eventually we'll put in bricks sub i dot act, or whatever we want to call it. And that will be a lovely thing <laughs> when that happens. But right now we're going to not worry about it too much. Okay, so we have all the automation, the loops, the arrays, all good to go. We just got to make it so that we can have the bricks in a grid. And you might already have a plan for that, so that's great. I'm going to show you a way to do it, but I'm going to make a few mistakes first just to illustrate what we've been doing and kind of connect it to what we're going to do. So the first mistake is that, I mean, we can do our brick just like we did our stars or our ripples, or our spikes, or our pixels, and we can just randomize them. So I can just say, you know, random width, random height, right? That's pretty much what our constructors have done so far. But if I do that, am I going to get a grid? No. I'm going to get a mess, which might make for a fun game, mind you. I'm not judging this as a bad game. It's just not the game we want to make, and I'm sort of arbitrarily saying that we're going to make a game with a grid so that we have a reason to learn about that kind of stuff. So if I run this project, here's my Brick Breaker game. Oh, what? This is a really hard... You're going to get like the paddle colliding with things. It's just, it's just not Brick Breaker, right? It's just not the original game. But how is it that I can get the 
the balls to sort of fall in line. So here's the answer. We're not going to do it in the constructor. The constructor is a, in a place where it doesn't really know a lot about the outside world, right? This is just one single lonely little brick. So instead of making the brick somehow aware of all of its surroundings and, and doing all of the math on its own, we're going to just make it an obedient, dutiful brick that will just go where we tell it to go. And we're going to open up a channel of communication, if you will, uh, a way to communicate to the brick where to go, so we could tell it where to go. And that parameter, or sorry, that uh, channel is called parameters. See this little space in here? We haven't made much use of it. We've always been typing in these parentheses, right? Every function you've made, void, setup, parenthesis, parenthesis. Void, draw, parenthesis, parenthesis. Vo uh, void, show, parenthesis, parenthesis. It's always been parenthesis, parenthesis, and you probably... If you have any ounce of curiosity anyway, you probably wondered, what the heck are those things for I keep typing down? Or you just were like, whatever. I just Apparently that's programming. You type in parenthesis, parenthesis, and it becomes a, a function. So we're going to make use of those parentheses at long last, and we're going to put some stuff in here. And what these things will be are called parameters. I'm going to put the word down here. We've used this word before. Uh, these, this word parameters, we've described as like, for example, in fill, 255 is the parameter, right? X, Y, 50, 50, those are parameters. But what does it look like on the other side? This is us calling a function. But in a, the code that defines ellipse, what does that look like? like we, we don't know. <laughs> That's what we're about to find out. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it possible to tell Brick where to go by putting in parameters into our constructor. And here's what it's going to look like. So instead of it saying just plain old Brick, we're going to put in float, and I'm going to use the word incoming x and float incoming y. I'll let you guys type that down, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about that. First of all, I want to make sure you know that the word incoming x, the fact that there's the word incoming in there, is not some special thing in processing. We could call that anything we want. You could call it forever alone, if you wanted to. You could call it, um, any, well, pretty much anything. You could name it. And actually, there's a shortcut for the word incoming in programming. Nobody likes to type that many letters. And so what usually people type is underscore x. And it's pronounced like incoming X. This is the X that's coming in. But I thought that would be pretty confusing. So I'm going to put it as just the fully typed out incoming X. But feel free to replace that with an underscore if you prefer. And the story here is that this is the number that's going to come from some external source that will tell this brick where to go. And the brick is just going to obey without any thought or error checking or anything. It's just going to go where it's told to. So we're just going to set x to incoming x, not random, incoming x, and we're going to set y to incoming y. So we've made our constructor in some ways just obey. And that can be a good thing, because now we can put all of our logic in a place that does know the big picture. We can kind of plan out the how things get laid out as we go. So now, unfortunately, the project's going to be a little bit broken. If I tried to run this, watch what happens. All of a sudden, we can't make a new brick anymore. And look at the error message. It says, the constructor, brick breaker dot brick, is undefined. The constructor is undefined. Gasp! What has happened? Our constructor, it's right here. Processing? Why don't you see it? The reason is because... It doesn't see it, us using these parameters. It sees us using no parameters. And so it's true that there is no constructor defined that has no parameters. So what we need to do is use them, make use of them. And I'm going to put some dumb things in here to start with. No, dumb is the right word. I'm going to put some things in here. And we'll just see what's wrong with them. And, and maybe you can puzzle out how to make them better. So I'm going to put some numbers in here. I'm going to say 100, 100. 
And this will now work. It won't fail. It will it'll run. But what do you suspect will happen? What what do you think you'll see? Say it again, sorry. Will, will we see 100 by 100 bricks? No, we won't, but good guess. What do you think? Will X be 100 and Y be 100? That's right. So this information, we're sending it. This is the incoming X and this is the incoming Y. So when we build a brick, it's gonna incoming X will be 100, incoming Y will be 100. So we'll make our bricks at 100, 100. So how many bricks are we going to see? One brick. We will see the last brick. Here, I'll run it. There are 60 bricks there, but they're all in the same place. So you might be like, wow, that was a lot of work just to do that dumb thing. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Belcher. But, the, but we're on the edge of something. What we can do is we can make these variables, and we can make them change. So I'm going to make two new variables, and you're welcome to do this too. I'm going to make float x and y. Right, actually, I'll do them on separate uh, lines. And we'll just set them at 0 and 0 to start with. David, thanks for your question. Uh, why it actually shows a 100 by 100? Well, then you've done something completely different that I did not program. So you've done your own programming. So, awesome. So, x and y. These are going to be our variables that we're going to use to plan out the positions of x and y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put x and y in here. I've really just postponed the problem, right? Now they're just all going to be at 0, 0. But now that they're variables, I can change it from one brick to the next. So the first time through the loop, I'll make it at 0, 0. And then we'll go to the next brick. And then I'll change x as well. So I can say x equals x plus, uh, wait, what's my uh, rate, uh, diameter is 50, so I'll go x equals x plus 50. Now watch what happens. I'm going to run this, and we get a whole bunch of bricks. Well, they're sort of in the edge on the corner there, and we didn't, we don't see where they go, but it turns out they just keep on going. Watch this, I'm going to drag the window out. Look at where all my other bricks are. They're just up there, all along the corner, all trapped up there. So what's the answer? How do, we, how do we get them out of there? And how do we get them all on screen? They're sort of off screen right now. So first of all, let's solve the problem of getting them on screen. I don't want my, my brick to start at 0, 0. That seems like a bad place. I want to move it, maybe starting right here. See where I'm gesturing with the mouse? Wouldn't that be a nice place for our bricks to start? Give us a little border along the edge. That'd be pretty. What, what would that number be, you think, if I want my brick to start right there? What would be an X and Y to make that happen, given that they're 50 wide? 50, 50. 50, 50. Let's try it. I'll start it at 50 and 50. We'll run that, and hey, much better. Looking a lot better. So they start here at 50, 50, and they move along the way. That looks a lot nicer. But wait, they end. Uh, I mean, they don't end. They keep on going. How could I make it so that once we got to a certain value of x, that it would stop going to the right and instead reset back to the beginning of the row and then go down by 50? If statement. Exactly. Yeah, we could write an if statement. So we could say, we'll go up by 50, and if x equals... Whatever number you want to put in there, I'll put in, say, 600 or whatever. You guys can choose whatever number you want. Then I'll reset x back to 50. And I'll increase y by 50. So that my next brick that I construct will be on the next row. And we'll start a whole new row. We'll only do that when it gets to the end of the row. Let's see, does that work? No, not bad, but hey, wait, well, how come it's not even? Well, if you count it out, we get, on in one row, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, oh, 11. Oh, 11 bricks. So, if you wanted to make this have 10 bricks, you're going to have to adjust the numbers a little bit more. 10 bricks per row, I should say. 
So we're almost there. I mean, a few students last class, they were like, I don't want to do that math, Mr. Pelche. I'm going to count how many bricks I'm missing. One, two, three, four, five, six. And they went up here and they just made that 66. And then they ran it. I was like, oh, that's kind of smart. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you're welcome just to do that. But if you wanted to have, you know, 60 bricks all together and have 10 rows of six, then it would just be a matter of figuring out where's the correct starting place. And where's the right ending place for a row? And just change those numbers up. So I'm going to stop here and let you guys sort of figure out what structure you want to have for your rows. You don't have to have 66 bricks like there is there. You can have any number of bricks. You can make them any size. Uh, well, I should say, you know, have, have lots of them. Don't have one brick. When I say any number of bricks, I mean any number that's greater than probably like 15 or so. Uh, but yeah, make your structure, make it symmetrical. And give yourself some space on the edge. I don't know if you know the joy yet, but if you've never played Breakout, one of the re really fun things is to get the ball, just sneak up the side of the corner and get on the top, and just start breaking all the bricks from the top. Oh, it feels so good when that happens. So <laughs> give yourself the possibility of experiencing that joy by having a gap along the edges. So I'll let you do that. And then the next thing is that I'm going to leave you guys to work on, mostly on your own for, the, for this class, and the next class we'll look at it again is writing the ball class and the paddle class, which we've done no work in. So you have a fair bit of experience now writing classes. So what I'd like you guys to do is to create those classes and take a look at your old Pong project. Remind yourself, how do you move the ball? It's not just X and Y, right? There's also a DX and a DY that will give you the rise and run, uh, or essentially the direction of that ball. And how is it that you make the paddle move with the keyboard? And yeah, I think we'll do keyboard for sure, because that'll remind us how to do that for future gaming projects. It'll be a bit of a, a review for you guys. But don't just put that in your tab as some sort of function or, or something. Put that into a class and make one ball and one paddle and actually make it show itself and act and all that kind of stuff. Make it object-oriented, but use the ideas that we use from the Pong project to, to code those up. So that'll create a bunch of different questions that I'm sure we'll have to answer as we go forward. But those are the questions we really want to be asking right now. That'll really be sort of how do you kind of merge the first half of the course and the second half of the course together. So go ahead and get started on all those wonderful things. I'm going to publish this video and I'll put it on my website so that you can take a look at it and review it. And we'll see. Hopefully it worked out just fine. Thanks, folks.